The Allen Lund Company appreciates all of the dedicated carriers it takes to move loads across the U.S. Stay safe. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. The Walk On Trucking Show is right around the corner. It's the 35th year for the Wisconsin show and the last. We speak with the event's vice president about what led to that difficult decision and what's happening at this year's show. There are a number of challenges associated with electrifying heavy trucks and charging them is a big one. But what if you could charge the truck while you drive? Researchers at Purdue University are giving it a shot. We'll have the story. And finally, the July 4th holiday made for a short week, which had an impact on the spot market. We speak with Robert Rouse of DAT to find out how much load posts dropped and the effect on rates. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. Our top story today, the committee tasked with providing recommendations on ways to reduce the number of underride crashes failed to find common ground. The result, two reports from the Advisory Committee on Underride Protections, one that consists of recommendations from the majority of members and another of dissent from those in the minority. In short, the majority report calls for a side underride guard mandate on all semi-trailers and single-unit trucks, while the minority report advocates for objective and evidence-based studies before any comprehensive underride regulations are pursued. The fracture report prompted the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association to write a letter to lawmakers calling out the lack of a true consensus. In comments signed by OIDA President Todd Spencer, the association said the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration should not advance potential new underwrite standards until further research, analysis, and testing is completed, as directed in the bipartisan infrastructure law. The only recommendations that garnered true consensus support among panel members, OIDA wrote, involve conducting more research, and as such, OIDA said those are the only elements of the final report that Congress and the USDOT should take seriously. The 16 members of the Advisory Committee on Underwrite Protections met several times over recent months, and the divisions were clear from the outset. A good bulk of time during meetings was spent on procedural motions rather than generating a unified plan. At the February meeting, the committee argued over the definition of a consensus. The members representing safety groups argued that a simple majority would suffice as a consensus, even though previous DOT committees have required thresholds of 75 percent or higher. Noting that divide, OIDA in its letter wrote that safety advocates on the committee, quote, manipulated their numerical advantage in committee membership and approved a motion to define consensus as a simple majority that minimized opposing viewpoints of other participants, end quote. What happens next is unclear. NHTSA issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking in 2023 that considered requiring side guards on trailers. The comment period ended in July of 2023 with about 2,000 comments submitted. Preliminary research provided by NHTSA indicates a mandate would cost as much as $1.2 billion annually while saving fewer than 20 lives each year. A long-awaited proposal aimed at improving broker transparency is still on track to be released this fall. According to the USDOT Spring 2024 Unified Regulatory Agenda, FMCSA still has October circled on the calendar to unveil its notice of proposed rulemaking on the issue. The rulemaking was prompted by a petition from OIDA in 2020. It asked the agency then to do two things in particular. One, to require that brokers automatically provide an electronic copy of each transaction record within 48 hours after a service has been completed. And two, to explicitly prohibit brokers from including any provision that requires carriers to waive their rights to access the records. Current regulations already require that brokers keep records of each transaction with a carrier and that each party to the transaction has a right to view those records. OIDA asked the agency to begin enforcing that regulation and to eliminate any loopholes that allow brokers to sidestep it. The agency granted OIDA's petition in March of 2023 and first targeted June of that year to release a proposal. FMCSA, however, later shifted that target date to October of this year. Considering the amount of broker fraud in the industry, OIDA continues its calls for FMCSA to act as soon as possible. 
Sales of used Class 8 trucks were up in May. That's according to the latest numbers from ACT Research. Nearly 23,000 used trucks were sold in May, up 18 percent from a year earlier. The average retail sale price was also down in May, more than 15 percent to a little more than $58,000. Steve Tam, vice president of ACT Research, says they expect the price outlooks to soften in their next update due to a weaker-than-expected freight market. Cargo theft isn't just an American problem. Equite Association, Canada's national authority on insurance crime, says more than $500 million worth of trucks, trailers and cargo have been stolen throughout their country over the past five years. Nearly half has gone unrecovered, but the problem has been trending downward in the past couple years. Canadian officials say truck, trailer and cargo load theft reached a high point in 2022, but thefts decreased 30 percent last year. Akite Association attributes that to the introduction of special dedicated cargo theft units in Ontario's law enforcement, but also to the fact that thieves mostly focused on auto thefts in 2023. Next year, however, Akite predicts the criminals will turn their focus once again to the heavy-duty sector. The biggest hotspots for cargo theft in Canada are Ontario and Quebec. Another lawmaker is throwing their support behind another bill in the House that would force federal agencies to take a step back when crafting new regulations. Representative Michelle Fishbach of Minnesota is the 10th co-sponsor of the Prove It Act. The bipartisan bill was introduced by Congressman Brad Finstad of Minnesota in February. He told Landline at the time that it's designed with small business owners at front of mind, like owner-operators, who make up some 96 percent of the trucking industry. He wants federal agencies to consider how new regulations might affect small businesses before moving forward with them. The Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association is among those supporting the Prove It Act. The association says the bill would help keep government overreach and burdensome overregulation off of the backs of the men and women behind the wheel who keep our economy moving. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is finalizing plans that will affect the construction of future roadways. The final rule announced Wednesday will require that public infrastructure, including roads and bridges, rebuilt after a disaster with federal funding, be elevated at least two feet above the local flood level. The rule takes effect on September 9th. First proposed in 2015, the standards are in response to the growing threat of climate change, which contributes to flooding events. The announcement comes just days after Hurricane Barrel hit Texas as the second-ever Category 5 Atlantic hurricane on record to form in July. Improvements to the Interstate 90 State Route 18 interchange will soon create some traffic problems in Washington state. The DOT there says a project will come in stages and along with them lane closures and lane shifting. Drivers along I-90 will notice the changes this week. Growth in the Snoqualmie Valley has made the I-90 Route 18 interchange one of the busiest in Washington state. The project is intended to improve traffic flow. Work is set to be completed before the end of this year. And finally, if you've frequented a Love's Travel Stop recently, you may have noticed something new. Numbers on the truck parking spaces. The move has generated some buzz online and concerns that the company is getting ready to charge for parking. That is not the case. In a statement to Landline, a Love spokesperson said the numbered spots are in the name of safety. Love said if there's an issue with a driver, management can more easily direct emergency services to the truck. It also helps with food deliveries. The spokesperson reiterated that Love's has no immediate plans to add paid parking. And that's Lane Line Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. Do you have a news tip? Maybe you have a comment about something you heard on the air. Email us at landlinenow at oodda.com. Starting Thursday, Marty Ellis and OOIDA's tour truck, the spirit of the American trucker, will be at the Walcott Truckers Jamboree. That takes place at the Iowa 80 truck stop in Walcott, Iowa. Stop in, say hi to Marty, and join OOIDA for a $10 discount. Next, Ashley Blackford tells us about the final round of the long-running Wapon Trucking Show. Scott Thompson talks with two researchers about charging electric trucks while they're running, and we'll hear about the impact of the July 4th holiday on the spot market from Robert Rouse of DAT. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media.
Capital Reman is your leading source for quality remanufactured engines and components. Capital Reman stands ready to serve all OOIDA members to help reduce costly engine repairs or replacement. Visit CapitalReman.com today and use code OOIDA10 to save. ULSD is hurting your engine. Fight back with Howe's Diesel Defender. Get the most powerful cleaning and maximum lubricity to protect and extend the life of your entire system. Add a guaranteed increase in fuel economy, and you can't go wrong with Howe's. Dispatch, I picked up that load of steel, so I'm ready to roll. Sounds good. Remember, we're getting paid by weight, so make sure to use a CAT scale. <laughs> I wouldn't weigh anywhere else. For fitness accuracy, when you check on a CAT scale. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline now, welcome back. The Wapan Truck and Show is coming up. This annual event takes place in Wapan, Wisconsin on August 9th and 10th. Nancy Kutchenreiter is the show's vice president. She joins me now. Nancy, how long have you been involved in this show? Um, I've been involved for 27 years. Wow. How long has the show been going on? It's been going on for 35 years. Actually, 36, but the first year, the gentleman that put it together, um, it took a good year to, to plan for it and everything. So, but it has been 35 years. Wow. Uh, yeah, I'm curious, just, yeah, for those who aren't aware, talk to me about what the show is and and what it's been like over the years. What it's been through the years, it's been an, an awesome show. Um, it's in a smaller town, um, Wapan, Wisconsin. It is a show that it's pretty much a show that people come to as a reunion. You meet so many different people, you make so many friends, and each year people come. Um, people have been coming for 35 years. People have been coming, um, you know, less years, but. They realize coming to the Walpon Truck Show, it's like a family event. And it's a event for families to come that you don't have to pay admission, pay for parking. You come in and you see these beautiful trucks. Um, we have what's called um, the Walpon Truck Show started out as the working truck. It was for the working class trucks to come in and be proud of what they have to show and then it moved up to the working show truck, and now we have actually, it's, they're all separate, the show truck class. And 27 years ago, how did you get involved in this? <laughs> I got involved through my brother. He actually had a working truck brought in to um, the Walpon Truck Show, and he didn't take a trophy. <laughs> and he said they're... How it, how it was judged, he says, I believe I should have won. And I said yes, because he put a lot of hard work, which a lot of these people do. They put a lot of work into polishing and cleaning their trucks. And I called Ron Van de Zandy at the time, and he was the president of the Walpon Truck Show at that time. And he told me, he says, well, this is quite interesting. He says, why don't you come up to one of our meetings and we can discuss it? And that's how I kind of got if you want to call it, looped into <laughs> the Walpon Truck Show. They liked my ideas, and I became a member at, at that time of the Walpon Truck Show. Now, you said your brother had a truck. What, what, were, what were your ties to trucking? I've worked in the industry pretty much all my life. I started out working at Peterbilt of Wisconsin, which is called JX Enterprise now. So I started out there, worked in the service end. I worked in the finance and and then I started after I left uh, Peterbilt I stayed in the trucking industry and worked at other companies longest where I stayed was at JD Logistics which was out of Waukesha Wisconsin there I did pretty much everything and you en it was a job that you enjoyed going to I think that's what I like about the trucking industry from safety to dispatch to accounting, and it's just the, the people that you meet in this industry that makes your job um, enjoyable. Yeah, that kind of goes into my next question. What is it um, about the industry that that you enjoy so much and that just kept you in it all these years? Being in the trucking industry, I think it's a field. It's not a field for everybody, but when you once you're in this type of a field, the trucking industry, it's pretty much in your blood. I 
enjoyed it. Um, and the reason why is because it is the backbone of this country is the is the trucking industry. What we get at our stores, what we get at anything that you think of, it came from a truck. And I think that's why I, en- I enjoy it so much. It's a passion that you kind of you learn and you enjoy. Um, and it's the people that you meet in this industry, too. Hardworking people. Did you think 27 years ago when you got involved in the show that you'd be still in it 27 years later? No. <laughs> um, and, you know, life changes. You start having, you know, I had started my family. I was actually, I had a son and I was actually, my daughter's 26. So I remember being pregnant, standing in line, helping drivers um, fill the registrations out. And today when they see my daughter, who is 26, the ones that I know I have known pretty much for 27 years, they just say, that can't be Jennifer. I said, yes. And she's married, and sooner or later she'll be starting her family. So it's just how life kind of goes. But the people that I have met, I've met wonderful people in the trucking industry and with the Walpon Truck Show. And talk to me about how has that been, you know, starting out, Cracked almost three decades ago, and then having the same people come back year after year, and kind of giving getting to follow them and throughout their career. It's almost like a family reunion. Um, I mean, we stay contact through the year, but when the Wapan Truck Show comes every year, second week of August, it's an excitement that you're going to be seeing people that you haven't seen all year, um, and it's you know you. You've seen what they've come and gone, you know, what they've gone through, um, you know, their kids or family members that may have, they lost. And you kind of, you gained a relationship with these people and they became very good friends. um, Some of them, um, no matter where they're at, if they're from Wisconsin or down in Texas or even up in Canada, um, we've had people from all over come to the Walpon Truck Show. But when people come to the Walpon Truck Show, no matter if it's their first time or if it's their 35th time now this year, they'll say it's it's one of a kind because we show different emotions for what we do. You laugh, you cry, you know, it's just not all about competition. It's people say the people that come to the Walpon Truck Show, we are the most friendliest. We make them feel at home. It's just one of a kind of a show. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the last year for the show, is that right? Correct, yes. Now, talk to me about that. That's, I assume, you know, bittersweet or, or how, how what, I guess, how did that decision get made? Um, it was a very hard decision. It was a very emotional decision. You know, we, we just, you know, we used to have 50 members and now we're down to, well, under, under 12. And the majority of us that, that run this show and it was a decision that we wanted to make. We've lost some really good people. One of them was uh, Ron Van de Zandy back during COVID. He was the president of the Wapon Truck Show. Um, we lost Steve Went. He was the treasurer for many, many years. He was one of the founders of the show. So was Ron. And we just lost this past year Phil Rook and many others that we have lost in the past. But we realized that some of us are getting older, some of us have health issues, and we just wanted to be part of this show and take it out in a bane um, because it is a very successful show, and we just felt that it was time. 35 years is a long time for a nonprofit organization, that w- which we are, um, and we just felt that with several of us that do have health issues, a lot of us were longtime members and getting older, that it was a decision that we had to make. We didn't want to, but we just feel that it, it's time. And, you know, losing those members over the years, do you think younger people are just kind of in a place of life that, you know, life is busy? And is that why do you think, you know, not as many people? Yeah. Past couple of years, I would say past two or three years, we've been asking for you know, the next generation to take over. We wanted them to be part of it so they would watch and be part of us of how this show has stayed successful for 35 years. Um, We've had members come and go, but I think it's just the lifestyles of that generation. People are very busy today. It's everything's in the left lane. And I feel that um, it 
it's the show that you just can't plan in, in a 30, 30 days. This show, when we're done in August on Saturday, that following week, we're already discussing, you know, the bands and, and so forth. And come October, we're kicking it in already for the next year. And it is, it's, it, it is a lot of work to plan. I don't think people realize the planning for this show. It's a huge event and it turns in to be an almost a full-time job for some people. And, you need to be that way to run a successful show. And I just feel that it's, we just couldn't get the help and we wanted the show to go out being successful. Mm-hmm. What are some things that are planned to happen this year at the show? Um, this year we're bringing some people back. It's called back from the past. Um, we have who's called Joe's performance out of Pennsylvania he used to come to the show several years ago with his trucks that blow the the flames out of the stacks. Um, we have him coming back, kind of a, a like a, a reunion type thing of bringing some people back that haven't come. I'm getting lots of calls of people that haven't been to the show in five or ten years that are actually coming to the show because it is the last show. Um, we have, of course, the competition with all you know the trophy competition the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which we have been sponsoring for many, many years, and the REACH program, which is a huge organization um, that helps family and kids in the surrounding area here. We have the, the Friday Night Light Show, which is one of the biggest light shows in the Midwest, and we pray for no rain. <laughs> Wisconsin's been getting a lot of rain, but hopefully um, that Friday night we can uh, light up the sky and then we have, on Saturday, we have um, the parade. It's the Parade of Pride. We also, on Saturday, have our auction, which is for Saturday, Take It Back Friday. We have an auction for Reach. And the auction is, um, we're auctioning the first, second, and third spots in the parade and so forth with um, Saturday for, for Make-A-Wish. It's the first, second, third spots in the parade. And those proceeds go to those organizations. Nice. Now, you mentioned earlier, people come from all over for the show, especially this year. Yes. Yes. I have people coming from from Texas, California, Florida, um, just to name a few, um, Canada, from the East Coast to the West. And it's out there. Those Walpon truck shows have been raining um, quite a bit. People asking I heard that this is the last year. It can't be, um, but they want to be part of it. What do you think you are going to miss the most about this show? The most is going to be the people. For 27 years, you know, I don't want to use the word sacrifice, but for 27 years, second weekend of August has always been my family um, and everybody's time for the Walpon Truck Show. I'm going to miss the people that I have seen and met. I'm going to miss hearing those trucks roaring into Wapan, seeing trucks that I've never seen before that are, you wonder where, you know, how, how they deck these trucks out. Um, just being part of this organization itself for what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I'm really going to miss. We're going to, that's what I'm really going to miss helping the make a wish foundation for the kids, helping reach program for families and kids. That's what the Walpon Show's purpose is. We have given to many other organizations, um, the Special Olympics, MAC Fund in the past. Um, that's what I'm going to miss because I feel it is something that I can do and all the rest of the members that we can do to help to help others. It's just Simply, it's it's just a good show. It's a good time. I mean, you laugh, and it's just a time for us to all reunite. I think that's what I'm really going to miss is the is getting together with everybody that I have been getting together with for 27 years. We've all meet we all meet there, and I think that's what I'm going to miss. That was Nancy Kutchenreiter talking about the Wapan Truck and Show coming up on August 9th and 10th. For more information, you can visit wapontruckandshow.com. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Stay tuned for more after this. Every year, 28 million people are trafficked globally. 
the Your Roads Their Freedom campaign seeks to raise awareness in the transport industry. Truck and bus drivers, be vigilant on the roads. If you see something suspicious, text 233-733 or be free. I'm in the middle of nowhere and I need a great repair vendor right now. Truckdown.com, 24-7 access to 40,000 verified heavy-duty repair vendors nationwide. Truckdown verified. Vendor qualified. Truckdown.com. Firestone tires are for more of everything, with more durability for more miles and more confidence in your fleet. Firestone's tested tires help fleets save with value where it matters most. Learn more at BridgestoneNationalFleet.com slash four more miles. Landline Now, welcome back. There are a number of challenges associated with electrifying heavy trucks, from the increased weight and the lack of charging infrastructure to the time it takes to charge a single truck for long distances and more. But what if you could charge the truck while you drive? Researchers at Purdue University are giving it a shot with a truck provided by Cummins. To learn more about the project, I recently spoke with Steve McCarrick. I'm a professor here at Purdue in electrical and computer engineering. And John Cressy. See, I lead a team at Cummins Corporate Research and Technology, and we're looking at next generation electrification technologies for battery electric and hybrid powertrains, and this includes charging systems. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get to it. I wanted to know about the origins of this project, which takes us back a few years to conversations surrounding something called dynamic wireless power transfer. Some have likened it to the way some of us charge our smartphones on a charging pad using magnetic fields. The technology at the center of this project, Pekarik says, is similar. As you had indicated, the technology is there in terms of low power applications. So those with a cell phone, if you have a charging stand that's wireless, you're setting up magnetic fields from what we call a transmitter. It's actually time-varying magnetic fields. And within your phone, there's a receiver to accept energy, that magnetic energy. Here we're doing something very similar. Within the electrified roadways, you would place electrical conductors you would then uh, provide energy to them that sets up time-changing magnetic fields and your receiver underneath the vehicle sees those and takes that energy. And our goal really is to send that energy to the wheels uh, so that you don't have to charge your battery. You're providing the power to the propulsion system of your truck. Forget the battery for a second we would like to just keep the state of charge of your battery. The only purpose of the battery is to get you onto this roadway, get you off this roadway. And so as you're driving, the, the electrified roadway is providing you the power to move your vehicle and to provide the auxiliaries to your, you know, whatever you need within your vehicle. But the bass in some ways bypassed, you're sending energy beyond it to, so that you don't need a large battery. That's the goal. Purdue University is part of a consortium called Aspire. Several universities are involved, and so are industry partners like Cummins, all working together to overcome some of the challenges associated with vehicle charging. As Purdue was developing this project, Cressy says Cummins was paying attention. We thought, you know, we have been working on stationary wireless charging, and we saw that maybe for relatively um, low amount of money, we could become involved and repurpose one of those trucks for dynamic wireless power transfer. So we thought, hmm, this technology is interesting. We can get involved for not a whole lot of money. And, you know, as you have both been talking, what are the biggest challenges in commercial vehicle electrification right now? I, two weeks ago, I was at ACT Expo out in Las Vegas conference, and it, it's a wonderful conference, all the new technologies, but the vehicle OEM, uh, executives were all lamenting the fact that market adoption of battery electric is just not taking off. And why is that? Well, you know, you've, you've pointed it out. Cost of the batteries, cost of the trucks, range of the trucks, where's the charging infrastructure? You know, truckers have a trouble finding a place to just park overnight. And where are they going to charge? Are they going to charge overnight? That's going to be difficult. Are we going to have fast megawatt charging? Wired, maybe. Probably, but that that a lot of grid electrification. So if you look at dynamic wireless power transfer, what NDOT and Purdue are trying to do here, they can solve a lot of those problems. Smaller battery, lower cost trucks, 
providing the charging infrastructure or power transfer technology or infrastructure, it seems like it can really lead the industry to develop a solution that'll work for the truckers. Cressy called this project an incredible opportunity, but not one without question marks. It'll be done in phases, and each phase will take some time. Phase one is underway with construction of a test roadway beginning at U.S. Highway 231-52, just west of the Purdue campus in West Lafayette, Indiana. In this initial quarter-mile section, it's taking an existing roadway. Uh, They've been milling channels to place the transmitter coils and that's under that's in process uh, and those coils are being manufactured and we're, we're proud of this Cummins is a, a world leader they're an Indiana company but there's also Indiana companies involved throughout this process so William Charles and White Construction uh, they're doing this roadway The milling's continuing, and in the next month or so, coils will be placed in the roadway, and then we'll be waiting on the electronics to bring uh, to the side of the roadway that provide the energy to the the, um, coils. And then we expect, we're hoping a Cummins generator will provide us with the power to to support those tests. Yeah, well, in parallel, we're... Look, working with Purdue to understand how we're going to integrate their receiver pad. So as as Steve talked earlier, there's transmitters, coils in the roadway, and then there's a receiver pad on the truck. And that receiver pad is designed by Purdue. And then there's power electronics, which convert the the AC power that's being transferred to, to DC that the, the vehicle... Um, Either the batteries or the or the powertrain or the accessories can then use. So we're working right now with the Purdue researchers and in integrating our their their components onto our truck. We're doing the design. There's obviously controls when you add this. How do you communicate between the two? The truck, you know, at times may want 100 kilowatts of power transfer, and sometimes it'll may want the maximum which may be in excess of 200 kilowatts. So we're working through these details. And then near the end of this year, early next year, we'll uh, physically do that integration on on one of our battery electric uh, demo trucks. And then um, about a year from now, you can show up in West Lafayette and, and see this testing in action. As for those challenges, there are more than a few, but both Cressy and Picaric are confident this will yield results. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I think I think we'll get the technology down. I, I think the project will be successful from a technology standpoint. I worry about the cost. Can we truly get the cost? And can we have financing partners that understand the payback for the for this is in the 10 15 year 20 year time frame but i you know this technology will work in some manner it will be rolled out commercially in certainly limited areas to to obtain wide scale electrification which may be 20% of the interstates let's say and bat, you can have a battery to go in between. I think that's something I'm, I'm unsure. You know that that's my worry. I think it has great potential, but can we get the cost down? You know, the part of that cost, of course, is providing the connections, the power to the roadway, right? So you have to supply the utility or this new entity. We're calling a public-private partnership at least to start, which we'll call an electrified roadway. They have to prov- they have to get power from a utility, and then put it to the roadway. They have to bill and all of those type of details. The billing part, I'm sure, they want to make money. That's not the issue. The issue is, you know, where do you get the power from associated with this? Let's say it's 10, 10 megawatt levels of power every mile. Okay, where are you going to get that from, especially in a power desert? Uh, you know, maybe this is between 
uh, Indianapolis and Columbus, Ohio, on a major uh, trucking uh, roadway. Okay, what happens midway through there where you don't have large amounts of power? How do you get that there? That's going to be the big part of this is that rollout. I think that's the the big hurdle. Since it's in its early stages, there's no telling where this project may be in the years to come. But if it is successful? Well, I think John alluded to and initially that it would likely be on select dedicated roadway sections, you know. And in our initial vision, looking long term, is this is consecutive over large swaths of the interna- uh, interstate system. That's not talking... That's not uh, anytime soon. So my speculation is this would be placed on main thoroughfares, uh, you know, 100 mile sections and dedicated vehicle over those sections consistently. As the technology matures, then it uh, moves out from there and you have, uh, you know, larger swaths of the interstate system dedicated to this and that may be 25 or 30 years from now it'll roll out in in regions maybe heavy heavy uh, obviously heavy transportation regions there'll still be overnight depot level charging um if you if you look at um there there are dedicated identified electric vehicle corridors that the federal government has said, these are the corridors. And you just look at where truck traffic is predominant and you can go after those. And and some people, if, if we build it, some people will start using it and some people won't. And if those that start using it start to gain a competitive advantage because they, they don't have trouble finding charging stations, they're building the trucks, they're buying trucks with smaller batteries. And if it works, fleets are pretty smart. They'll they'll gravitate to those to those solutions that work. Now, again, it's going to start off in regional regional haul, but but pretty soon you'll have regional haul trucks that maybe aren't stopping for overnight charging, or they're able to easily run the you know slip seat where they don't have to stop and you know charge overnight. So. I, I think if, you know, it's one of those, if we build it, they will come. I, I think that'll happen. But again, it'll happen, like Steve alluded to, in limited regions, and then it'll start to build out. Time will tell how this project pans out, but Cressy said something will, and engineers are working to come up with the best solutions possible. Some in the industry use the, the term for the next 15, 20 years, the, the messy middle on what our powertrains and what our trucks are going to be powered by. Is it going to be hydrogen? Is it going to be fuel cell? Is it going to be natural gas? Is it going to continue to be diesel? Are, are hybrids? And you know, Cummins is looking at all of that because we know, again, over the next 15, 20 years, there has to be a, a wide variety of solutions. And then we'll see what can work cost effectively. And if we're successful at projects like this, well, then battery electric will be a lot more usable productive, cost-effective to the truckers. We can't have the truckers have to try to find a charging station, and now they're running low, and now they have to wait. I mean, again, you can <laughs> you can think of the, the challenges to uh, electrified trucking. We need to make it easy. It, you know, part of the problem is diesel is so incredible. People don't realize that the phenomenal energy density, and we're trying to create solutions that compete against this because trucking fleets and truckers don't want to change their operational model, nor should they radically. Small operational changes, maybe, but um, you know how are we going to compete against that with the new technologies? And this dynamic wireless power transfer could could be a way. Our thanks to Steve Pekarik and John Cressy for their time and their work on this project. This was just a portion of our talk. For the entire conversation, we'll have it posted over on the Landline Media page on YouTube. We'll step out for a moment here, but there's more Landline now right around the corner. Stick around. 
Today's rising costs affect everyone. Replace your harmonic damper with a genuine Vibratech TVD viscous damper to prevent costly repairs and downtime. Keep your money in your pocket and your truck on the road with Vibratech TVD. Recommended replacement at 500,000 miles or 15,000 hours. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2024 when you purchase Loadboard Pro. Are you tired of the IRS following you around like a dark cloud? Call 888-557-4020 and get your life back. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Landline Now, welcome back. There are a number of critical questions you need to answer in order to run a successful trucking business. Among the most important of those questions are, where's the freight going to be and how much is it going to pay? Today, Landline Now Senior Correspondent Ashley Blackford will bring us answers to both of those important questions with a look at this week's freight markets with the folks from DAT. Here's Ashley Now with the report. Thanks, Mark. And hello to Robert Rouse with DAT. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm doing great, Ashley. Thanks for asking. Now, after a short week due to the July 4th holiday, are we seeing an increase or decrease in freight volumes and rates? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely had an impact. And, uh, you know, first off, I just want to hope a lot of drivers were able to spend some time over the last weekend celebrating our great country and our independence. And, you know, we definitely saw that in our numbers. Uh, We saw some of the normal changes during a holiday week. Um, The number of loads posted on the DAT1 load board dropped 48% down to 1.26 million loads last week, Um, while the number of trucks posted also fell by 21%, down to 262,000, almost 263,000 trucks. Last week included the July 4th holiday, which many businesses took off as the four-day weekend. Um, The holiday suppressed volumes compared to the prior week, which was one of the busiest of the freight calendar with 2.4 million loads posted on it. Um, And since last week was a short one, we typically see loaded truck ratios drastically change. Um, This rarely is a major indicator of any lasting change in in the market. That said, the next couple of weeks of summer can really be an indicator of what to expect for the rest of the year. With more potential port labor disputes looming on the East Coast, Um, We could potentially see shippers move up some of their holiday freight uh, to ensure that it doesn't get disrupted by moving it through some other ports like uh, the West Coast or or doing different things. Um, So that could change freight dynamics over the next couple of weeks, and we'll definitely be watching for that. Then lastly, when we look at freight rates, we saw pretty minor movement in the underlying rates with vans remaining flat at $1.70 without fuel, and flatbeds were down about $0.03 per mile. However, we did see reefer rates increase slightly. The national average reefer line haul rates increased by just under two cents per mile to two dollars and four cents per mile, excluding fuel last week, and three cents per mile lower than last year on about fifteen percent higher volume of loads moved. Um, so we're moving a lot more loads, but the the prices are still not quite at the same level. Mid April to July fourth unofficially defines the impact of produce season on spot market rates. Um, And with reefer line haul rates increasing by about 19 cents per mile over those last 11 weeks, um, compared to the average in the prior produce seasons, this year's increase is just a penny per mile higher than we saw in 2016, and excluding uh, pandemic influence seasons like 2020, 2021, and 2022. Now, with hurricane season in full swing, how do these storms impact our supply chain? Will there be a major change in the markets hit by the storm? Yeah, hurricane season always brings risk of massive disruptions, not just to supply chain, but to people's lives and well-being. Um, that's where the transportation industry has the ability to help lift communities back up, to rebuild, resupply, and help people in their neighborhoods return to their normal lives. 
This year could actually be a major one for storms. The NOAA's outlook for the 2024 Atlantic hurricane season, which spans from June 1st to November 30th, predicts an 85% chance of an above normal season, a 10% chance of a near normal season, and only a 5% chance of a below normal season. Um, the NOAA is forecasting a range of from a 17 to 25 total named storms. Those are storms with winds of 39 miles per hour or higher. Of those, 8 to 13 are forecasted to become hurricanes, which is classified anything above 74 miles per hour, and including 4 to 7 being major category 3, 4, or 5. And those are have winds of 111 miles or higher. Um, forecasters have about a 70% confidence in these ranges. So that means there's definitely going to be some impacts of, of these hurricanes on our supply chain. Um, with major weather events like hurricanes, freight movement tends to follow a pretty common pattern um, that is pretty predictable that carriers can use. Um, but within that pattern, some of the circumstances and freight flows do change pretty quickly. So there's really three effects that hurricanes, hurricanes have on freight. First, before the storm, if it's predicted in advance, um, which a lot of times it can be, shippers and FEMA rush to move freight in and out of areas where the storm is expected to make landfall and truckload rates rise pretty sharply. Second, during the storm, nothing moves in and out of the affected area. It's not safe, but FEMA and other organizations will move emergency relief supplies to locations just outside the storm zone so they're ready to act as soon as the road's clear. That's usually when you'll see FEMA moving loads and drivers sitting for a couple days to sometimes waiting for that all clear to move that stuff in. Lastly, after the storm is over, emergency supplies are brought in and inbound rates shoot way up, at least for a little while. Van and reefer rates move in first, followed by flatbeds hauling construction and equipment materials that are much needed to restart the rebuild process. So depending on where the hurricane makes landfall, the disruptions can be pretty far reaching. For example, this is one that we use quite often. When Hurricane Harvey hit Houston in 2017, it triggered a massive reset to the supply chains. Since Houston is a main hub for all types and modes of freights, um, transportation had to be rerouted, causing truck shortages in places like Memphis and Greenville, South Carolina. Ocean cargo had to be diverted to other deep water ports like Miami or uh, Los Angeles uh, or Long Beach. Um, but the, the hurricane this week, so on Monday, Hurricane Burl made landfall near the coastal town of Matagorda, Texas, about 85 miles south-southwest of Houston, in packing maximum sustained winds of 80 miles per hour. So far, we have not seen truckload capacity tighten in the Gulf Coast markets, especially for um, van and flatbed freight. While we're seeing some movement in these markets, we do not expect to see a long lasting impact on these markets as we did with Harvey. It really comes down to the destruction that happens in those, those. not there wasn't that there wasn't any destruction, it just wasn't at the same level that Harvey was. And so that doesn't change the freight markets as much. And so this one seems to be a pretty short impact. So you probably this week and maybe a little bit next week, we'll see some impact to those markets, but not uh, massive as, as you might see. Um, with the NOAA's prediction and the fact that Hurricane Burl was the largest storm this early in the season in history, owner operators should pay close attention to future storms and have a plan for how to gather the data on the market impact and rates so that they can take advantage of those um, and move freight to help out those regions. What are some of the top safety tips for truck drivers to keep in mind during the summer months? The first is, you know, pretty basic. Stay alert and well-rested. Um, ensure you have adequate sleep for those long drives and avoid fatigue and take regular breaks um, so you can stay vigilant out there. Also plan your route. Um, you know, obviously a lot of drivers using GPS and traffic apps to avoid congested and accident prone areas or plan for alternate routes um, in case of road closures or heavy traffic. Um, also, you know, you might think weather conditions might not be as important in the summer as they are in the winter, but they definitely need to take those into consideration. Also, there's going to be a lot more pedestrians and cyclist activities out there. Um, so just be extra vigilant and watch out for those high pedestrian areas. Um, and then one that's probably not thought about as much is 
you want to stay hydrated and eat pretty healthy. Um, in the hot weather, it can really take your energy down really, really quick and r reduce your ability to react to certain situations. So make sure to drink plenty of water, stay hydrated, have extra water there. That's one of the best things you can do um, to, to stay alert is, is keep really hydrated. And then try to eat as much balanced meals as you can to maintain your energy and alertness. If our listeners want more information, where can they go for that? Yeah, you can get the latest rate information at DAT.com forward slash trendlines or look for the weekly market updates on the DAT blog. They're published every Wednesday. All right, Robert, thank you so much. Thanks, Ashley. That was Robert Rouse with DAT. Mark, back to you. Thanks, Ashley. That's our program for today. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Penske owns and operates some of the best-maintained vehicles on the planet. Our used trucks come with a five-year maintenance report and pre-sale inspection. So if you're in the market for a top-quality pre-owned truck, look no further. Search our inventory today at PenskeUsedTrucks.com. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. I'm a dad, a son, a husband, wife, I'm a writer, photographer, I farm, I'm a veteran, I love old cars, fishing, my kids, chrome, and I am, I am, I am a professional truck driver. And together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the Owner-Operator Independent Drivers Association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.